Well, we're back again this afternoon. I'm Reverend Dr. J. Lawrence Turner, Senior Pastor of Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church, Disciples of Christ here in Memphis, Tennessee. I want to welcome you to the message in the middle where we come to be refueled, renewed, to rekindle that which we need in order to make it through the rest of the week. And I'm glad you've taken time to join with us. And as you have joined with us on today, I want you to help me get the word out to others. You might be a little late logging on. So take a moment, if you're watching from Facebook Live, I want you to share this stream on your page and invite others to join with us. Send some hearts up, send some thumbs up uh, to let others know what you're taking part in. And then as well, if you're watching from our YouTube channel, if you're not a subscriber by now, come on, what you're waiting on? Become a subscriber so that you get updates each and every time we're uploading new and exciting content on our YouTube channel. And you can share this as well. You can text the link to somebody. You could tweet it out to your network on Twitter. And on today, we prepare to continue this series, Good Trouble. And in this installment of our series, Good Trouble, there's a word that comes from Exodus that talks about moving forward even while we go back. And so as you take part uh, in this particular message, I want you to invite others to do the same. I want you to take out your Bible. Let's go into this word today, moving forward by going back. Will you pray with me? Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. You are my strength. You are my redeemer. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to continue our series on today entitled Good Trouble. And I would that you would meet me in the second book of the Bible, the second book of the Torah entitled Exodus. Exodus chapter 4 has three verses I want to live for us. I do invite you in your quiet moments to read chapters 1 through 4 as they do constitute the context in which we shall preach on today. But I want to read verses 18 through 20 in your hearing and it says this Moses went back to Jethro his father-in-law and said to him please let me go back to my brothers in Egypt to see whether they are still alive. And Jethro said to Moses, go in peace. The Lord said to Moses in Midian, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. So Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt. And Moses took the staff of God in his hand. Hand. I want to tag this text today, moving forward by going back. Our lives are all about moving forward and making progress. We seem to spend our lives reaching higher, clamoring for greater, and moving from glory to glory. That seems to be a theme that is embedded into our faith tradition as early as the father of the faith, Abraham, who God calls from comfort and familiarity to a place that God was going to show him. If we skip over to the New Testament, we see that this is Paul's frame of mind when it comes to Christian living, when he writes in his epistle to the Philippians, not that I have already obtained this or am already perfect, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Brothers, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal of the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Our lives are about moving forward and making progress. Oh, if I were only, if it were only that simple, brothers and sisters. We also know in Christian faith that what we perceive on the surface to be one way may be the opposite. Jesus teaches us that the greatness that we aspire towards comes from being a servant. He teaches us whoever saves his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life for the sake of the gospel will save it. And what we learn from the call of Moses and his ministry is as God's people, sometimes God moves us forward by calling us back to the places that we once were. God does this to use us as agents of freedom and transformation and salvation. 
in 1903. Fisk alum and Harvard PhD W.E.B. Du Bois published an article entitled The Negro Problem. In it, he raises the idea or the concept of what we have called the talented tent. It was his argument for the higher education of African Americans who would in turn provide leadership to the masses of our people out of the throes of oppression and degradation. Du Bois wrote, get this, the Negro race, like all races, is going to be saved by its exceptional men. The problem of education then among Negroes must first of all deal with the talented tenth. It is the problem of developing the best of this race they may guide the mass away from the contamination and death of the worst in their own and other races. What Du Bois was suggesting is that if we can hone and sharpen the best minds of our people, they could become the catalyst that lift our people to a place of freedom and human dignity as God's children. There are varied opinions as to the plausibility of Du Bois's theory because over the course of our history in this nation, it has been those who have pursued higher education that have provided leadership to our people. From Mary McLeod Bethune to Booker T. Washington to Benjamin Elijah Mays to Dorothy Height on to so many others, as a matter of fact, that has been one of the enduring legacies of historically black colleges and universities. They have produced leaders who have not only led nationally, but have as well led in their local communities. However, somewhere along the line after the modern civil rights movement, those who have benefited from its victories through the Civil Rights Act, Voting Rights Act, on to the affirmative action uh, uh, laws of our country have lost our way. Instead of feeling a responsibility or a calling to return back to the communities that they've come from and lead our people to higher ground, many have settled to live in the enclaves of personal prosperity while many of our people have been pushed to the margins, forced to make brick with no straw. Here in our text, on this day we read the seminal narrative of engagement in prophetic ministry. We find the exemplar of, of one who got himself into good and necessary trouble. We often overlook the nuances and complexity of his own personal struggle. The burning bush, ten plagues, and crossing of the Red Sea dominate our memories of Exodus because they highlight the supernatural ways that God intervenes on behalf of God's people to set us free from bondage and oppression. At the same time, this narrative has much to say to those who are engaged in prophetic ministry and the prophetic community. If we just take a moment to peruse this passage, we will discover that when it comes to the ways of God and how God is using each of us for his purposes, sometimes the way forward is going back. If I can give greater clarity, the way forward together is by answering the call of God to go back as an instrument of God's liberation to let the oppressed go free. I want to suggest a few things about going back. First of all, going back, you have to face your fears. After Moses encountered with the burning bush that was on fire that was not consumed and after his initial protestations and after he gains the consent of his father-in-law under the guise that he wants to do a wellness check on his family in Egypt, God speaks to him. God says, go back to Egypt for all the men who were seeking your life are dead. It seems like a particularly odd reason for God to give to Moses when we only read this verse at face value. This is why context is important. When you go back to chapter 2 and verses 11 and 12, we capture an event in Moses' life where it says one day when Moses had grown up, he went out to his people and looked on their burdens and he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, one of his people. He looked this way and that and seeing no one, he struck down the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. 
Moses saw an Egyptian abusing one of his people and he became judge, jury, and executioner. He's actually the first episode of the ABC hit show How to Get Away with Murder because he takes the body and hides it in the sand. However, his crime didn't go unnoticed. Other Hebrews saw what he did and on top of that verse, verse 15 of chapter 2 tells us when Pharaoh heard of it, he sought to kill Moses, but Moses fled from Pharaoh and stayed in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. Now Moses flees and goes on the run and ends up settling in Midian. Midian means strife or place of judgment. He hides out in Midian, marries in Midian. He probably resigns to spend the rest of his life in Midian, but little does he know that God's plan for him was to call him from the backside of the desert, from living in strife and judgment, from tending flocks to leading God's people from slavery to freedom. But in order to do that, he has to deal with the real possibility of facing the threat on his own life. But God calls him out of a place of judgment to, to face his fear, letting him know that those who seek his life are now dead. And maybe this is a word for those who have felt a holy nudge, a call of sorts to, to not just give back, but to go back to the places of your greatest failure and, 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 and face your fears. You, you, you fear what others might know about your past, how they might hold it over you or how they'll hold it against you. You might not fear death, but you fear embarrassment and shame and guilt and having to face the judgment of the very same people. God is using you to set free, but this text is tailored to teach you and me that no fear we have is great enough to opt out of God's call on your life. Moses should have been reminded of his infancy when Pharaoh ordered all of the Hebrew boys to be murdered as soon as they were born. Yet his courageous mother hid him in a miniature ark and placed him in the Nile River to shield him from the threat of genocide. And he finds himself preserved and protected by the same household that was seeking to destroy his life and, and, and the lives of so many other Hebrew boys. It just goes to show that when there is destiny on your life, when there is a call on your life to fulfill, and if God has a plan for you, there is nothing to fear because God is letting you know that he's going to protect you and preserve you and even defend you from your greatest fears. But y'all, the text doesn't stop there. The text also teaches us that we have to go back despite our flaws. When I speak of flaws, I'm not speaking of moral failures. I'm speaking of personal inadequacies. It is not in the specific pericope that I read in your hearing, but it's in, the, in chapter 3 on over to chapter 4. Moses attempts to take a pass on the assignment God has for him. He tries to explain to God why God seems to be wrong in calling him. He tries to say, Lord, they won't listen to me because I'm not believable. By the end of the first nine verses, God deals with all of those reservations. Then in, uh, in, in, the, in the 10th verse of chapter 4, Moses says, oh, my Lord, I'm not eloquent. <laughs> uh, and he goes on to say that he's slow of speech and of tongue. God gets him right together and says, I made you. Just go do what I tell you to do, and I'll be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. And if that was not enough to satisfy Moses, he tries to ask for a substitute. And God allows Aaron to be his sidekick on this journey. Now, Moses hang up with this assignment was for him to go speak truth to power. And he had a challenge because he was not eloquent. What he learns is about the omniscience of God. God knew about any challenge he had with speech before he called him, and God still chooses uh, to send him to complete the liberating assignment. And I need to tell each of us, when God calls you, you're not being called despite, you're being called despite your flaws. Might I say, as a side note, none of us qualify to be used by God for God's purposes. We're all works of grace, and we should be humbled that God wants to include us in his plan. And I believe God uses a Moses who does not have eloquence in speech because if he would have used a great orator, they would have thought Israel's liberation was a result of their own brilliance in speech. 
But if I have learned anything about God, God can take the weak, uneducated, marginalized, and unsophisticated to do some of his greatest work. Why? Because God's strength is made perfect in our weakness. Dr. William Barber always says that whenever God uses us to do his work, it is God who's taking the risk of putting treasure in jars of clay that are often flawed, cracked, and broken. But what I would add is that we might be broken and flawed jars of clay, but what's important is that God keeps God's hands on us. And I need to tell us, despite our flaws, when we are in the the hands of God, great things can happen if we make ourselves available to God. I love it when Milton Brunson helps us to respond when God places a call on our lives, when we should respond to that call by saying, Lord, I'm available to you. My will I give to you. I'll do what you say. Use me, Lord, to show someone the way and enable me to say that my storage is empty and I am available to you text says finally that we can move forward when going back when we go back with faith verse 20 says Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey and went back to the land of Egypt and Moses get this took the staff of God in his hand Moses may have been flawed and he may have been fearful but he goes back in faith what demonstrates this is that he does not take a sword a knife, a dagger. He does not put on body armor or shield. All that he has in his hand is a staff. When you rewind back to the beginning of chapter 4, you discover what Moses learned about this staff. The text says, the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff. And he said, throw it on the ground. So he threw it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses ran from it. But the Lord said to Moses, put out your hand and catch it by the tail. So he put out his hand and caught it, and it became a staff in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord, the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has appeared to you. God doesn't give him anything new. God takes what he has in his hand and shows him the power of what he already has. That, brothers and sisters, that if God can take a staff and turn it into a serpent, surely this God who makes bushes, bushes catch on fire and not be burned up and can cause you to put your hand in your cloak and make it leprous and remove it and your hand is cleansed is the God who is able to set God's people free from the yoke of oppression that they find themselves under. Now, I say all of that to say to us that God might be saying to us to just use what you have. Don't delay anything to try to find something new. Use what you got. Quite possibly, God is saying to those of us who make up the black church to use what we've always had all along. You may have uh, taken the time to view the documentary on PBS about the black church. And what God spoke to me is that we don't need another institution or organization or movement. What we need to do is to recommit ourselves to what we have, recommit ourselves to the church and allow God to re-energize it and revival can come to our cities. People can be set free from debt and poverty. The prison industrial complex can be broken down. We need to use what we have and allow God to bless it. And I close, y'all, when I tell you that possibly what will give us the strength to move our people forward by going back in faith is by taking a look back. You know, Sankofa is the word that originates in the tribal lexicons of Ghana. It means it's not taboo to fetch what is at risk of being left behind. It is symbolized by a bird whose feet are firmly planted facing forward while its head is turned looking back. <laughs> the wisdom of the saying and the symbol is that the past serves as a guide for planning our future. And I would suggest that this is the spirit, the ethos that the black church and the black community have to embrace as it carves a pathway of hope that is bad as things are right now. We must stop acting like we haven't been in situations like this before. I wish I had a witness. We, we, we faced 
worse than the current threat before. We faced slavers so crafty that while granting themselves inalienable rights would take away our rights by denying that we were created in the very image of God, only constituting three-fifths of a human being, but yet we kept Moving forward, our foreparents emerged from slavery with just the clothes on their backs and an unfulfilled promise of 40 acres and a mule. And they built churches and colleges and financial institutions. And we kept moving through the terror of lynchings when white supremacists contrived that black men are a threat to the safety and purity of white women. We kept moving on and moving on up and became to, to the point that we became a threat to the social order when we would not accept segregation so they ended up killing Emmett Till and Mecca Evans and Malcolm X and Martin King and Goodman Schwerner and Cheney and Fred Hampton after they did all of that we're still here we cannot be stopped and when we look back after all that God has brought us through and brought us over what God is bringing us to we have hope in the midst of despair that the, es that the essence of our faith we're people who have a bounce back in our spirit greater is he that lives on the inside of us than he that's in the world the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed weeping endures for a night but joy comes in the morning but one more look back we have to do is to look back at Calvary to Jesus Christ who is the personification and quintessence because he went he when he was hit by genocide he kept on going when he was hit with parental misunderstanding he kept on going and said I must be about my father's business when hit with temptation by Satan uh, he, he, he said he kept hitting Satan back with the word of God and kept moving forward when hit with Trump the charges and sentenced to death by crucifixion he gave up the ghost and died and just when we thought that Jesus was counted out early Sunday morning he rose from the dead with all power in his hands teaching us that we you can't keep a good man down that's why we need to look back and when we look back over our lives we know that we can move forward in faith we can move forward despite our fears and we can move forward in the face of our flaws and I want to speak to somebody on today someone who's allowed your fears to get the best of you who feel your flaws have counted you out feeling that they have in some way disqualified you for being used by God there's some of you who need to renew your faith and recommit yourselves and just use what God has given you God is calling you now to go back, go back and show that young woman who's lost her way, that young man who's aligned himself with the gang, that God has a future for them. Let that single mother know as she's trying to rear those children by herself, doing the best that she can, working two jobs to make ends meet. Let her know that she's not alone. Go back down your own memory lane. Realize you haven't lived as good as you're living right now. You haven't driven that luxury car all along. But God has brought you, in fact, from a mighty long way. And if you've been blessed in that way, the greatest way that you can pass it along is by going back and getting others who have been left behind, ensnared by the challenges of this life. If you are viewing on today, I want to offer Jesus Christ to you. He wants a relationship with you. And if I were you, I would not take it as happenstance that you have logged on to this worship experience on today. And you want to accept the unconditional love of Jesus Christ, knowing that he's died for you. He's risen from the grave and that one day he's coming back for his church. And if you want to give your life to Jesus Christ, I'm going to show you how you can do that, and our team will assist you in making good on the decision that you're making in this moment. But secondly, there are not only those who are giving their lives to Jesus Christ, there are others of you who are watching, you're already saved. You already have a relationship with Jesus, but you're not connected to a church family. And we would love to have you as part of Mississippi Boulevard Christian Church Disciples of Christ. We are a movement of wholeness in this fragmented world. 
we want you to join us on not only the journey of walking with Jesus Christ, but join us in making an impact in this city and even around the world. If you're in one of those two categories, I want you to respond in one of the two following ways. You can either send an email right now to connect at the boulevard.org. Send an email to connect at the boulevard.org. Or you can send a text message. I want you to text the word belong to 901 446 4242. 901 446 4242. Text the word belong to that number, and our team is going to be responding right back to you and assisting you in the decision that you are making on today. I want every saint to be praying for decisions that are being made right now. Somebody's life is on the line. Somebody is possibly on the edge of making a decision that's going to have eternal ramifications and we want to be in prayer for them. They would take the step of faith on today. Go ahead, send an email right now, connect with the boulevard.org or send a text message to 901-446-4242 and just to affirm the decision that you have made. Come on, we're celebrating in our homes. We're typing hallelujah in the comment section. We're rejoicing like the angels in heaven over one who gives their life to Jesus Christ. I hope you were blessed for that message as it lived again on this afternoon. And if somebody missed it, go ahead, tag them so that they go back and watch this. Well, brothers and sisters, there are amazing things happening in the life of our church, and you don't want to miss any of them. So make sure you're paying attention to the Boulevard Blitz at the end of every worship experience, as well as you can always check out the, the work that's going on in our church through our monthly e-news. Download the Boulevard app or check out the boulevard.org so you can stay up to date on the great things happening at the Boulevard. Well, I look forward to seeing you this Sunday. And as we head out on today, we continue African American Music Month. And I am excited to welcome my frat brother, my profite, uh, as he comes to bless us with his melodious voice. Gerald Richardson is going to bless us as we head out today. Until I see you on this Sunday, may God bless you, may God keep you, is my prayer.
on But who were they to judge us Simply cause our hair is long You know we've got to find a way To bring some loving here today Yeah Picket signs And picket signs Talk to me 